anticipated it. Why? Why were you looking forward to it? Why did you anticipate it? That I might meditate upon thy word. David knew that's when I'm going to be in the word. So the point is, you need to have it planned out. I'm going to be in the Bible and you need to look forward to it. You need to anticipate it. Th this really should be something that we look forward to, you know. It, it shouldn't be something that we just dread. Sometimes we honestly just do. We just dread studying the Bible because we're like, well, I guess i got to do it. it. It doesn't need to be that way. You think? Word? Do you think God really wants you to treat it that way? Something that we just try to squeeze in our day and, yeah, when I do squeeze it in, it's kind of hard to do anyway and I don't really like it, but I'm going to do it. It really shouldn't be that way. So point number one, schedule your study and make it fixed. Set in stone, plan on it, it's going to happen. Point number one. Alright? Point number two. Point number two. Here's something else that you can do that will help you to, de to develop a better kind of study habit. Now, again, these rules that I'm giving you are just meant to be pointers. These are not anything that you have to do necessarily, but these are things that can help you to be a better student of the Bible. But point number two is it might be a good idea for you to study with somebody. Sometimes we try to do it all by ourselves. We think, you know, well, I'll just sort of schedule it for me and I'll just have my own personal study time. And that's good and I think we should have our own private personal study. But it might be a good idea to get somebody else in on that from time to time. And here's why. If you study with somebody else, that benefits you because you've got somebody else there that you can bounce ideas off of. You've got somebody else there who might be able to point out something that you didn't think of or something that you missed. It's good to get outside your own thought bubble sometimes because sometimes we have our own pattern of thinking and because of that we can't see certain things. I mean, I know me personally, I've studied before on a certain issue or a certain topic and I've went through it and went through it and went through it and studied it and looked at it and read it and I could not get anywhere with it, couldn't figure it out and here comes somebody and all of a sudden they just point out, well, look at that. And I'm thinking, well, duh, why didn't I see that before? Sometimes you need somebody who can look at it through different eyes than you. You need somebody to bounce things off of, to help you to point out certain things that you may have missed. And here's another benefit of studying with somebody. You know, if you study with somebody, you've got another person who's going to hold you accountable. You know, if you just do your own study all by yourself, it's easy to let yourself get away with not doing it. You think, well, you know, if I don't study today, who's going to know? Mama ain't going to know. Daddy ain't going to know. Grandma ain't going to know. Who's going to know but me? So we think we can get away with it. But on the other hand, if you've got somebody who's wanting a study and they're expecting it and you know they are, that's a lot harder to get out of. Now you can still get out of it. You can tell them, well, we ain't doing it today. But that's kind of harder to do, ain't it? So if you have somebody that you study with, it holds you accountable and it makes it to where more than likely you're going to get it done. You've got somebody now who's looking forward to it, they're anticipating it, it's got to get done. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24, Hebrews 10 24, in this passage the Hebrews writer tells us, let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and good works. Now you talk about provoking somebody, you think, well, it means provoke somebody to get mad. Well, not necessarily. You can provoke somebody to do something good. In this verse, he says we're supposed to provoke one another to do to love and good works. It's a lot easier to get yourself going to get yourself provoked into actually picking up the Bible and studying it 
if you've got somebody else there to help you. That's the point. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you can't get a good Bible study by yourself. You can. I'm not saying that you should never study the Bible alone. No, I mean you should, but it may be a good idea from time to time, if, if possible, to study with somebody. That can really help you as you're trying to begin to study the Bible for yourself. So point number two, study with somebody. All right? Here's the third point. Point number three, get rid of distractions. I mean, let's be real here, y'all. Let, let's just be real. Do you think you're going to have a good study if you know you've got something else right there in front of your face dancing around that you know is going to steal your attention away from the Bible? Do you think you're going to have a good study? Probably not. All right, don't try to study when Wheel of Fortune is on and you know you love Wheel of Fortune. Don't go into the living room, sit down on your, your recliner or your couch with your Bible out thinking, I'm going to study while I watch Wheel of Fortune. If you love that show, no, you ain't going to study. You ain't going to get anything done. You say, well, I'll just study during the commercial breaks. Good luck. Because when people get revved up in Wheel of Fortune during the commercial breaks, what do they do? Well, I can't believe you didn't know that one. I knew that answer, blah, blah, blah. Come on. Come on. If you're distracted by television, do not try to study while the television is going, okay? Cut it off. And here's another thing. I know that today most of us have our Bibles on our cell phones, and today when people study, most of the time they just get their phone out. I'll just skim through my phone. That may not be a good idea if you're the kind of person who gets a bunch of text messages all the time. Because you're going to be sitting there trying to study, and all of a sudden, phone will be buzzing and dinging and all this stuff going on, you ain't going to get nothing done. And plus you got Facebook on your phone, the internet, all this other stuff. Come on. It may be a good idea if you're distracted by all those kinds of things to put the phone down and to pick up good old-fashioned paper and ink. Because let me tell you something, the only kind of Facebooking you're going to be getting out of this thing is this. The only kind of text messaging you're going to be get out of this is from God, not anybody else, not your buddies, not your friends, God. So if you're distracted by the cell phone, it may not be a good idea to study by using the cell phone. Now, if you're not distracted by it, it's not a problem for you. More power to you. Use the thing. But if you're distracted by it, go another route, okay? We all know what distracts us. We all know what we like. Try to make sure those things are not around. Try to make sure that you get somewhere that's quiet. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 6, when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 6, He tells them that they need to go to their closet to pray. Now here's what that means. You say, well, does that mean that if I'm not standing in my closet, God's not going to hear me? No, that's not what that means. What that means is when you go to do your own personal prayers to God, keep it private. Go somewhere private. Go somewhere free of distraction. That's the point. Now, I want you to think about this. If that's true with prayer... I need to go somewhere that's private and free of distraction in order to pray to God. Shouldn't the same thing be true with our study? Because think about it, prayer is where I talk to God. When I talk to God, I need to keep that free from distraction. When I study the Bible, that's when God talks to me. Shouldn't I also keep that free from distraction as well? Well, yeah, you probably should. Look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse number 15, Paul writes to Timothy, and this is one of the things that he tells him. 1 Timothy 
He says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy, that thy profiting may appear to all. What I want you to notice is that Paul is telling Timothy, all the things that I've been telling you in this letter I've written to you, give yourself wholly. Give yourself completely over to these things. Okay, here's the point I'm trying to get you to see. Give yourself wholly over to your Bible study. Don't try to share that time with something else. Okay, give that time completely to God. Give yourself wholly over to that study. Put your mind all into that. In Romans chapter 14, verse 13, Paul warned the Christians at Rome that they were not supposed to put a stumbling block in the path of their brother. Okay, don't do something that you know is going to cause somebody else to trip and fall. Don't do something that you know is going to mess somebody else up that could possibly lead them into sin. Don't put a stumbling block in somebody else's way. Well, we need to think about that with regards to ourselves. Don't put a stumbling block in your own way. Okay, sometimes we do that when it comes to our study. Sometimes we just put stumbling blocks in our path all the time and we just set ourselves up to fail. You're putting a stumbling block in your own path when you're trying to study and you know there's a bunch of stuff around you that's going to distract you. You're setting yourself up to fail. Don't do that. So point number three, when you go to study, make sure it's a, you're studying in a place and in a way that is free of distraction. Okay? Point number four, and this is a really important point, and I really want you to get this one. Point number four. It may be a good idea, if you want to learn to study a little bit better, it may be a good idea for you to divide your study up. You know, I think most of us who really care about God, who really want to please Him and really want to do what He says, most of us honestly would like it if we could study the Bible for an hour every day, or maybe even two or three hours every day. We would love that because that would really be pleasing to God and that would really help us out if we could study the Bible that much every day. But we just can't seem to do it because I just really don't have an hour or two or three hours. I just don't have a time frame like that that's free. My day is just so full of all this and that and that and rigmarole and all this stuff. And you say, and even if I could sit down and study the Bible for an hour or so, my head would start hurting and, you know, I'm old and I can't do that and yada, 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 all these excuses. I'm about to blow them excuses out the water, y'all. I'm about to show y'all that none of us have the reason to ever give God that kind of an excuse. Here's how. Divide that study up. If you can't sit down and study the Bible for an hour because you say your head hurts or whatever, then divide it up into like 10 or 15 minute segments. Study the Bible 10, 15 minutes here. Study the Bible 10, 15 minutes here, 10, 15 minutes here, all throughout your day. And before you even know it, you've been studying longer than you could ever even imagine was possible. Divide that study up. Now just think about it with some common sense here. If you're going to go and eat a steak... You got this big, huge steak you just got to eat. Do you cram the thing in your mouth and try to choke it down? The whole thing, just choke that thing down in one sitting. No, you don't do that. What do you do? You cut it up into smaller pieces and then you eat it a piece at a time. That's how you handle a big steak. Well, how should I handle a big study? Maybe a good idea to divide it up. And there's actually some benefit that comes from doing it that way. The benefit is, number one, you get to study for a long period of time and it feels like nothing. It doesn't feel like it's been a long period of time. You don't get a headache from it. You split it up into such little segments, just don't feel like anything. And then number two, when you do that, what it actually does is it saturates your entire day 
with the Bible. Not just one little period. You know, if you sit down and you just study for an hour straight, you've got one hour period filled with the Bible. That's about all you got. But if you divide that thing up into several different sections throughout your day, you filled your whole day with the Bible. And that's going to help you to learn to center your mind upon the Bible, to center your daily life upon it. You know, just, just think about it this way. Just study the Bible for a few minutes every morning when you get up, before you go to work. And then when you're on your lunch break, study the Bible for a few minutes then. Study for a few minutes when you get home. Study a little bit before you go to bed. Just times like that. Just find a little bit of a time. It don't have to be long. Study for a little bit here, a little bit there, and boom. You've got it. Now, isn't that what the Bible says to do? Don't, don't you remember back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 when Moses was telling the people of Israel that they needed to be teaching their children the Word of God when they rose up? when they walked in the way and when they laid down to go to sleep. Isn't that what Moses told them to do? Study the Bible, not just for one little time period in the day. Well, I got my Bible study done for the day. No. You study it and you meditate upon it all throughout the day. In Psalm 119, verse 97, King David said, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation one hour period throughout the day. No. He said, it's my meditation day and night. All the day. So see, if you want to be in the Bible all the day, all the time, divide your study up into smaller sections that you can handle. Don't bite off more than you can chew in one setting. Now again, if you're the kind of person who can do it all in one setting, that works better for you, then do it. If that works for you, do it. But for most people, that may not work. It may give people a hard time trying to do it that way. So again, these pointers that I'm giving you, okay, y'all, these are not anything that's set in stone. You have to do these things. These are just some ideas and some guidelines I'm trying to give you that can help you and can benefit you as you are trying to learn the Bible for yourself. Now, as always, if there's one here among us who is not a Christian, we want to give you the opportunity to become one by obeying the gospel. The Bible says if you'll believe in Christ, repent of the sins that you have committed, confess your faith in Him before men, and then be immersed in water, you can have your sins forgiven by the blood of Christ. Now, if you've done that, you are a Christian, but you've been struggling and you've strayed away from the faith, we also want to give you the opportunity to repent and to come back to God. If there's anything we can help you with this morning, why don't you let it be known as together we stand and as we sing.